This podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's new Patreon community, the Global Coffee Think Tank. Check the show notes or head to patreon.com forward slash Mapper Forward to find out how you can become a member today. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and sadly, this is the last episode in our five-part series with the fabulous Judy Gaines. Judy, we have been talking about pricing and supply of coffee over the past four episodes. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, pricing volatility and what impact that's going to have on on producers, whether it's going to work for producers or against producers. And the reason that I really wanted to have this conversation is because different producers are approaching this in different ways from uh, the conversations that I've had. Some of them are seeing that the price is going up and they're just selling their crops, their stock. Others are saying, no, it's going to continue to go up. I'm going to withhold my stock and I'm just going to wait for it to achieve what I think is the maximum and uh, then I'm going to sell my coffee. Now that to me sounds like it could be something that works in their favor or against them but I also think that there's probably more at play than just the basic fundamentals of supply and demand economics. So what are your thoughts on this? Okay so we're historically very high prices Mm -hmm. and there is an expression that I love, and that is bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I love that. When you hear that producers are holding back on selling, waiting for higher prices, and they don't have protection on the downside in Mm. case the market crashed, it becomes very, very risky. Because you don't know at what point that turn is coming. And historically, when this market begins to fall, it's like jumping off a cliff and there's nothing without a parachute and there's nothing to stand in its way. Because as the supply situation improves or demand chokes off a little bit, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you know, the reason for the tightness is gone Mm -hmm. and the market is always forward looking and we'll see that, okay, down the road, the supply tightness is over. And now we have to see the price fall and fall hard because otherwise you're going to continue to have that signal to overproduce and you'll wind up in the exact opposite in a major price crisis again. So the brakes have to be put on the bull market in a timely manner, or it's going to create that massive oversupply and severely depressed prices. And the timing of it is always an uncertainty. Does human nature suggest that we're capable of doing that? Uh, Being our own handbrake? (laughs) Um. No, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And therefore, at some point, we're going to wind up with massive oversupply. And the the other sad part is there is going to be the producers that held off a little too long Mm -hmm. and missed the opportunity. And then maybe we'll say, you know what? I'm not selling here. I think it's just a balance. It's going to go higher and something's going to happen. And it doesn't. And then they're stuck with coffee where they they lost that opportunity, you know, to seize upon great prices. And that, you know, it's the unfortunate reality that always happens. Um, You know, not everyone can pick the top. The only people who pick the top are, you know, fools and liars, okay? Liars because no one really picks tops or fools because they just did it not really knowing, you know, it, by dumb chance. luck. Yeah. Yep. That, that's it. So, so it's go ahead. selling scale up is a more disciplined, better approach to it. And this is where, when we talk about rather than expanding crop diversity is probably going to be uh, more helpful than, you know, proliferating in the amount of supply that you're going to have long-term 
Uh, and di- if anyone hasn't heard the series with Diego Barreona, go and check it out because he talks about this in in that series. Um, what in, What is typically the cycle when we're in such volatile pricing times? Does it have a typical cycle length? Sure. The time it plants to put in a new nursery tree and to harvest your first crop. So about so, three years. <laughs> and, and, but the market will anticipate that okay. in advance. But I think there's a little bit of a new dynamic here because let's face it, in the past, price increases in coffee were predominantly because of a frost or drought in Brazil and then only a decade ago because of the problems in Colombia. Every other time there's been a real spike in the market. It's because of the weather problem in top coffee producing country. Right. And then all the other producers rode on the coattails of these higher prices because the unfortunate situation in Brazil. Mm. And even in Brazil, not every farmer was impacted by the drought. Not every farmer was hit by the frost. And there was a lot of producers in Brazil that are very high yields and productivity now are lots of cash in their pockets and can expand rapidly if they so choose to. However, there's a new dynamic. And I saw it when I was visiting Brazil earlier this year. There's a lot of areas that were coffee producing land and now it's soybeans or corn right okay and part of that is look corn and soybean prices are just like any other market and they're gonna fall and be depressed Mm -hmm. but you pull off two crops in one year you get cash in hand not have to wait three years Mm -hmm. or pay back at potentially some dirt cheap level and so there's Kind of this, I'm tired of the weight and the payoff in coffee that sometimes doesn't come. Mm -hmm. People invest a lot and then the market's depressed or they invested in coffee and all of a sudden in Brazil, there was the frost and the drought and they lost their income for a second year. Mm -hmm. And some there's something called zero safra. So for small producers where they try and economize and not spend for harvesting every year. So it reduces labor and they also try to maximize their yields. That's why you have this on off crop cycle because it's really based on the pruning, the skeletonizing of the trees. So those that were in the off cycle, And then, so didn't have a crop, zero software, one year. Then they had the drought and lost a good part of their production. And then they had expected the comeback for the 22, 23 crop. And they're seeing even worse production. So it's three years uh, for an unfortunate cluster of producers in Brazil who've really, really suffered badly. Mm -hmm. And some of them, are not coming back to coffee. They, you know, they, had they're enough. And, and even fish farming. I saw one, one farm where part of it on the lower altitude where it was hurt by the frost, you know, it's fish farm. Wow. Tilapia. And there's a lot of water in fish farming so they're going you know, to get, so i mean it's the thing right. it's going to be the, the, the water drought. runs down the hill right so oh, you know yeah it'll be between the drought and the frost right. i'm sure they were very uncomfortable mm-hmm. fish um that didn't survive those two massive climate events but these are the choices that the farmers are looking at mm-hmm. more so than in times past Right. And and this is where I want to talk about the impact of climate change on markets because it almost feels like producers are at the mercy of climate change in being able to make decisions about 
their their crops and that's going to have a flow on effect for markets because I, when we were talking last year about the frost that was the three frost events that impacted right. Brazil just the the idea that there was going to be record breaking frost uh, moved to the markets that's correct and then you know coincidentally this year the earliest recorded frost in Brazil happened in early May. And then it turned into a mild winter after that. So it really wasn't a problem. And when you look at the soil moisture levels and the crop conditions, um, most areas were able to overcome the issues from that May frost that occurred. Mm -hmm. But it, even so, it was still just from climate change, you have to wonder, you had a frost that occurred three weeks earlier than any other time in mm. history going back to 1882. Yeah, and where do we go from here? Is it going to get earlier and earlier and earlier? And what other weather events are going to? This is coming off of a drought for two years. Has the drought finished in Brazil? Is the well, there's a, you know, it's interesting because last week there were some rains Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people said, oh, it's the end of the drought. They got rains. But anytime there's irregular rainfall or off time rains, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. So no. the, the, the buds on the trees were really advanced this year and the dry weather helped on that. So a tree really needs like 60 days without rain to be stressed right before flowering. And that's when you have the most prolific bloom. Okay. And the rain that occurred last week basically was as a result of that. It wasn't massive quantity, small mm -hmm. quantity, but enough that chances are there'll be pictures of flowering trees circulating. The problem is the most ideal time for rain in Brazil is not mid-August, it's mid-September. Okay. And you need the follow-on rains to support the development of the crop and to fix the flowers and have the, the cherries form. And if it stays dry, then this is more lost crop because the timing isn't right. And we're sort of, you know, there's some rain that's forecast for the next couple of days. Now, it's not all of Brazil. It's just some key areas in southern Brazil that really make a difference. And there's some rain that's supposed to fall in the next couple of days. And if that falls when the flowers first open, the first 48 hours, then it mars the flower. It makes it very sticky and they don't fix and they're going to wind up being on the ground. Mm, and that happened so, last year, right? Well, last year's wasn't because of rain on the flowering. Last year was a completely different situation. I mean, the end result, the flowers were on the floor and there wasn't the coffee behind it, but that was because of the drought stress um, at the time right. where the buds form like their sexual characteristics to whether they're going to produce leaves and survival because you need more photosynthesis mm -hmm. and or produce a crop mm -hmm. and, and the fruit and the tree chose to for survival. I don't know how producers do it. Like the level of anxiety that is involved it's in massive. the volatility, it's huge. Like there's so much volatility in producing food crops. It's we don't have anywhere near enough appreciation for what producers have to go through to provide us with the food that we consume. Yeah, it's not it's not easy to be a farmer. I mean, oh. it, it, it's it's so difficult. There's so many things that can go wrong. And it's not just about like, oh, let's pay the farmer a fairer price for what they're doing i mean there are some things that are happening that have nothing to do with money really like if there is th there is adaptations to technology that need to be made there is 
yeah, a whole bunch, of, a whole slew of things. And I feel that the distance between the consumer and the farmer is just getting further and further and further apart from a lack of appreciation and understanding of what they actually have to go through to produce what we consume. Well, so. you know, you're on the specialty side and I'm yeah. on the futures mark and the economics, but certainly, you know, when I'm visiting the farms and I'm, I'm speaking with all the growers, you know, I, I hear the heartbreaking stories. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, and we hear some of them on this podcast, but not nearly enough because it's a... Uh, our bit, uh, the thing we grapple with the most right now in our industry is how do we get the consumer visibility to the producer? And I suspect that the producer, that the consumer doesn't care. They just want us to care that we're not participating in shady practices. Right. They want to trust us as as the small businesses to take care of bear, bearing the burden of that guilt and alleviating them from the pressure of needing to figure it out. At the end of the day, I think they just want to buy their cup of coffee uh, and make sure it tastes great. Well, isn't that like with any other product? You want to buy I agree. your watermelon, you want to buy your, right. you know, use the example before, you know, grapes versus bananas. I mean, yeah. Consumers have a choice of where they want to spend their money. It's the end right. of the day, the consumer choice. But I want to, you know, say something else here, which maybe isn't going to be as popular, okay? Because we always look towards Perfect. producer, okay? But I used to be a retail cafe owner. I had my frozen yogurt shops here in Panama. Yep. And I will tell you that, I would die if I was ever in retail again. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I just had a like exit. I love my stores. They're phenomenal. Everyone loved my stores, but there's just as many things that could go wrong owning a shop. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people appreciate the small business owner <laughs> as much. And it's, you know, I kind of say, I understand what the producer is going through. But every business has risks. And, you know, as you move up through the supply chain, the risks become greater and greater from a monetary standpoint. I mean, because of the financial capital that you have to invest, and then something happens where something arbitrary occurs, like they change some parking regulation, or you have 10 other stores open up near you. I mean, or there's Zika virus and tourists don't come. <laughs> I mean, or, or the pandemic and stores closed. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I wasn't caught in that at least, but, you know, businesses went out, you know, and, and what about the, the people who just opened a restaurant or a cafe and invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so? And all of a sudden they're forced to close. I often say yeah. if the producers and the consumers were more aware of how similar their plight is, yeah. I think we could get to more solutions because it's true. they're both small business owners. And uh, I... When producers say to me, but look, you're selling a cup of coffee for $5. That's more than you're paying me for a pound of coffee and you can get many more than one cup out of a pound of coffee. They don't understand the economics. They don't get the economics and on the consuming end, we don't understand the stress and the economics of what it is to be a producer. And all of these, um, as we were just talking about, how how – much anxiety is involved in having to just deal with the weather patterns, let alone getting understanding all the economics and the financial side of getting your coffee to market and right. all the different well, avenues to do that. What happens from the producer side is they forget how many times that coffee changes hands yep. and they forget how much is lost in roasting and they don't understand how much packaging is and they don't yep. understand how much rent is. 
and wages, plus, 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 yep. plus, plus, yep. insurance, everything, and losses from Barista's spilling a bag of coffee and, and yep. you name it. And that coffee that they're talking about, they're not adding the cost of the cup, the stir, the milk, the sugar, and the sugar that's the packets that someone is stealing from you. <laughs> And, everything and the else. furniture people are stealing from right. you and the, uh, it it goes on and on. It goes on and on, but, uh, you know, I as a consultant uh, that is working with uh, so many clients right now, remember, people, if you're listening to this, the margins on the consuming end of the coffee supply chain are razor thin, like way more razor thin than you could ever imagine. And that's exactly the same plight as what producers are experiencing. So we go through this whole supply chain and the winners of this whole endeavour are landlords and banks. Mm -hmm. That's the people who win in the coffee supply chain. To me, we need to find a better solution. Well, I think that when you look at the retailer, though, they have, they try and innovate. So they try and maximize sales per square footage and they're putting in, you know, be it donuts or sandwiches or other beverages to attract that foot traffic and really bolster the the bottom line, not through coffee, but you know, selling CDs, whatever, whatever it might be, or mugs right. and, and equipment. And they have that capacity to do so and to try to make it work and flex the menu and whatever they can do compared to the producer who might not have the ability to do so on their land mm. where there's a, another potential alternative cash crop because what happens is if everyone is putting in pepper, then that's going to crash the price of pepper. Right. Right. And I can tell you uh, from everything that I've seen, the majority of cafe owners will tell you that over time, time being let's say five years, as much as they've loved doing what they've done, the juice is often not worth the squeeze. Yep. So yeah. on that really yeah, optimistic point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Judy, done that, you know. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, the reality of it is that we need more responsible business owners coming into this with their eyes wide open into this industry. And being I starry-eyed. Think we have that. I think we have that. I mean, there are obviously the people, it's the same who, you know, want to open a bread and breakfast in Vermont, you know, that's like their, their right. dream, understand it. But I think that, you know, this industry has become far more sophisticated and it used to work that someone could be starry eyed and open up their small shop and succeed and, and grow. The problem is there's a lot of competition, rents are super high, labor is super high, and therefore the the barriers to entry are enormous. And you're only selling a cup of coffee. And even if you're selling a $5 cup of coffee, you've got to sell a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee. Absolutely. And that's if you can get later. Right. That's what we're seeing right now is you know, a lot of businesses have to close their doors, either reduce their hours or reduce their days just to be able to keep up with the labor force that they have. And that leads to reduced revenue annually, which ends up meaning that they usually can't meet their annual expenses. That's that's the phase of the model of the cycle that we're in right now. I think we're going to see quite the cleansing of the industry happening. We're going to see a lot of people who have been running zombie businesses for, uh, you know, a couple of years uh, or a little bit more than that. Those are on the way out. Um, and that's going to be hard. some of the major roasters, you know, the franchise business, also closing yeah. because you know like anything else they open too many and you know it's cannibalism absolutely and so that happens and as people 
learned to make more coffee at home during the pandemic and became home baristas. And they're saying, wait a second, I don't need to pay to have this great cup of coffee out anymore. Yeah. And, you know, there's inflationary pressures. Then that brings people back home again. Yeah. And people are going, you know, commuting as before. All of that hurts the retail side. But I would say it probably helps the producer if people are consuming more at home. Long term, I do see this being something that's going to increase the consumption of coffee. People are looking for how do they find that way of it being affordable. And Mm -hmm. if it's affordable, they're going to consume more. Uh, if they're going to need the vice, we're about to go through some very challenging times. <laughs> and I feel that coffee is going to be that thing that gives their soul a little bit of a hug. So he's hoping. Well, there, there's also another side to it. And that is innovation, not yep. just coffee, drinking coffee for drinking coffee, but there's other markets. Yep. So on the pharmaceutical side and, you know, coffee flavored um, candies and whatever it may be and all that kind of stuff and to use some of the waste for coffee in very productive sustainable ways so I think that that's a positive yeah there's plenty of opportunities this is what this time is for under stress create we we get diamonds so let's hope that people can can uh lean into that a little bit more that or we go for the peanut butter (laughs) Lady, you are speaking my language now. (laughs) Uh, Judy, thanks. This has been a great, I've learned so much in these five episodes, stuff that I never understood before and always hoped that I would, but now I do. Thank you very much for what you do. Oh, it's a pleasure. There are links into the show notes for your, uh, your newsletter as well as your LinkedIn and your YouTube channel. There is a lot of great stuff on your YouTube channel. I am subscribed. I listen to everything that, or I watch everything that you put up. Um, keep doing what you're doing and thank you so much for how much you contribute to the industry. Oh, it's so much fun. I love it. And we'll be back. We will be back. Podcast. Peace, love and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.